For me, being bipolar means that um, you will have long periods of just feeling normal and having a job and doing what everyone else does. And there will be periods where um, your feelings of feeling low and down and depressed get so out of control that it gets to a point where you can't function, you can't work, you can't love, you can't, you can't get out of bed. And then there's this other extreme when you're totally high and you can't work and you can't love and you can't function and and you're always out of bed. <laughs> Every night of the week I was going out, I was not sleeping, I believed I was the Virgin Mary. At the peak of the psychosis I wanted to save everybody in the sort of red light district of um, Sydney and I was a danger to myself and I wasn't a danger to others but I was endangering my reputation. I was in hospital for the first time for a very long time, I was in for about five or six weeks. That was when I was first diagnosed, that was when the doctor first came to me and said you have manic depressive illness, and I didn't have any idea what that was. I just sort of shrugged my shoulders and said, thanks very much, I'll see you later. I probably first got it in my early teens, um, but I started like using a lot of drugs. I was smoking a lot of pot and stuff like that. Um, and But I was really manic all the time. I always had too much energy, it felt like, and that's why I was smoking a lot of drugs to calm myself down. Things were totally out of perspective, you know, like I was thinking about the lawn. How am I going to mow the lawn? You know, I can't do it. I can't possibly do it, you know. And that's sort of when you're depressed. You can't, you can't believe, you know, how hard these things are. For me, I usually get high after I've been depressed. So this makes it even more complicated because it means that as I start to feel better, like, the highness actually starts to make me feel normal in the beginning. I sort of thought, gee, things are, things are getting all right. Eh? You know, I, I, I'm going to go up to Queensland on a trip. You know, this is going to be good. And uh, anyway, I'd swapped over. I'd, I'd swapped from depression to, to going high or manic, whatever they call it. It's manic, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And... Uh, so anyway, I headed off on this trip and went up to Queensland and and uh, did parachuting, which, you know, uh, I know a lot of people do it, but, you know, uh, I've always been terrified of heights. Then you go, well, so this is what normal people feel like. They um, they don't have to sleep 12 hours a day and um, and they feel confident. And, and then you go, wow, this is great. And it is great. I went marlin fishing. And I went, uh, you know, took a trip up to the Cape York on a, in a plane and, oh, it was wonderful. I could, you know, I could do things, you know, and make decisions. Buy a house, you know, sell a house, you know. I'm sick of that now. You slowly begin to lose insight. You slowly start to, to not know what's happening. You feel so, so... Uh, yeah, on top of the world, you know, like you're in charge and probably you're influencing Australia and you're going to make the place a better place, you know, you're really good, you know. And then, you know, you might, you might start to think, well, you know, maybe I am the son of God and... There seem to be a number of types of bipolar disorder. There's bipolar 1 disorder, which is the type I have. And that's basically sort of extremes of mood, you know, ranging from mania, which is often severe enough to need, you know, need to go to hospital, and severe depression that, again, is severe enough to sort of need, you know, 24-hour care, you know, with risk of suicide. Um, that's called bipolar 1 disorder. Um, there's bipolar 2 disorder, where the person has fairly awful episodes of depression and episodes of hypermania which aren't severe enough to get the person into hospital so the person just appears to be pretty creative and energetic at times and pretty depressed at other times. I, I view bipolar disorder as a very treatable condition 
Um, although the, the mood swings can be quite severe, these days we have very good treatments for the condition. So I'm optimistic for the vast majority of people that I treat with bipolar disorder. Um, the treatment, the, probably the centrepiece of treatment is medications because it's a very physical condition. But these days we're becoming aware that there are significant psychological and social factors that can worsen the illness or contribute to it or can be disrupted by the illness. So we're becoming increasingly aware of psychological treatments. In some ways for me it was a relief to be diagnosed with bipolar disorder because I could sort of say, well, okay, it's not my personality. I don't have a flawed personality. Um, I now know what the limits are of my functioning are and I do know now that there's medication that can help to reduce some of the sort of symptoms I've been getting. It made a lot of things make sense, you know what I mean? It made, because before any time I'd stop using drugs, it felt like I needed the drugs because I wasn't normal when, you know, I wasn't using them. But it kind of made me understand that I just, you know, had a problem. And so I, you know, realised that there were other ways that I could kind of manage that problem and that you know, allow me to take the drugs out of my life. You think to yourself, oh, no, I, I couldn't have bipolar disease. You, you just sort of think that's somebody else, you know, it, it shouldn't be you, you know. That's the hardest thing, that's trying to accept that you've got the illness. Oh, yeah, acceptance is, is definitely the hardest thing. For so long it just takes, you know, you just... Um, denying it, you're telling everyone else to get stuffed and, you know, you're not going to take the medication and you don't need the medication, you know, you, you'll find everyone else is stuffed and, you know, and, you know, everyone else get get buggered, you know, but um, it's, it's like you versus the world, you know, but, but, when, but when you're doing that, you've got like, um, you're expending so much energy, you know, you're sort of like, it's you versus the illness and, and you versus the world. But then when you take the illness as part of you, it's like, it's almost like the illness can work for you. The key to managing manic depressive illness is medication. And it's complicated medication. There's a whole range of medications and it's powerful medication. I tend to think of three phases of the illness that we're treating. The first is the treatment of acute mania, the second is the depressed phase of the illness, and the third is the prevention, um, stopping future episodes of depression and mania. Um, if we look at the treatment of acute mania and the prevention, that the treatments are quite similar, that we're using what we call mood stabiliser medications. Mood stabilisers are medications that um, treat the acute um, unwellness during mania and prevent newer episodes. People would be most familiar with lithium, which has been around for 50 years. When when you get those highs and lows, it's <clears throat> it's not a good it's not a good life. That's for sure. But now I've sort of evened out, and I don't get the mood swings. I, uh, I yeah, I feel I feel a lot better. And I sort of look back to the times when I had those big mood swings, and I think, oh, geez, I don't want to do that again. Um, there are also two other treatments uh, that we call mood stabilisers. And the brand names for those are Epilim, which is otherwise known as sodium valproate, and Tegretol, which is carbamazepine. And these medications are effective for calming the acute manic disturbance, as well as stopping future episodes. Lithium didn't work for me, and I think that's really important to let people know, because lithium's not always a wonder drug for everyone. It was only when I got on Epilim and Tegretol although now I only take Epilim because I've gotten better, that I, my thinking was clear for the first time. The good thing about the, the prophylactic drugs is that they don't interfere with your functioning. They don't affect your personality, they don't affect your creativity, they simply regulate the mood. Um, you know, um, people who are creative artists who take lithium say, they're more productive, you know, they get more things done when they're on lithium. It doesn't affect the way you view the world. Um, it just, all it will do is regulate the amount of energy you've got and help you to order that energy so that you can actually produce something at the end of it. When people are manic, the behaviour can be quite disrupted. Now the difficulty with the mood stabilisers is they're going to take about a week or two to work. So if you've got a family member who's acutely manic, 
You can't wait a week or two to start to calm the behaviour. Um, we use the antipsychotic medications to calm someone down. When I've been into the psychiatric wards, and uh, you know, I'd be there in a manic state, you know, and you, you have the lithium, and I think they give you a metal as well, probably the same as I have now. And uh, you know, within a matter of a couple of days, you know, you sort of, you sort of more normal. Usually we withdraw the antipsychotic medications once the manic episode starts to settle. During the depressed phase of the illness, an antidepressant is usually going to be necessary as well as the mood stabiliser. Antidepressants are going to take normally one to two weeks to work, so you have to be patient and just give it time. Um, occasionally, if someone is very depressed, we might need to consider an older treatment such as ECT, but in these days, this would be uncommonly used, although people shouldn't be scared if that's going to be necessary. I've had a manic attack when, when I, I've been on lithium. I was on it, and I, and I still got it. Hmm. But, but see, then it comes into, like we were saying before, if you're under stress, I was under stress then. I was sort of moving around and that, trying to find, find places to sort of stay. And... Uh, it stressed me and I reckon that's why I, want, you know, I had it, had the manic attack. You can religiously take your pills, <laughs> but you know, if there's some stress in your life, it's not going to sort of protect you entirely. It may mean that you won't have quite as severe an episode as you would have had without the pills, but um, it may not mean, you know, it may be that um, you're still going to have an episode of mood disorder anyway, despite taking the medication. The choice was to take take your medication you might might not be well like you might still be up and down up and down but it's better than taking no medication at all because I had one episode where I was going out with a particular man who was very health conscious and and bless his heart he was trying to do the best he didn't like me taking medicine so we went on a naturopath journey but didn't actually see a naturopath and went jogging in the morning instead of the antidepressant. We replaced everything with natural things, drank honey and milk at night instead of a sedative. Um, but there was no mood stabiliser, and that's what I, I have a mood disorder. And very quickly I went into the worst psychotic episode I have ever had, where I was homeless, I left home. I didn't think there was anything wrong with being homeless. I know myself when I was told you've got to take this medication, I didn't want to take medication, I felt fine, why should I take medication, particularly when it gives me some effect, you know, side effects that I don't like. But I think from what I've learned over the years, I now know that it's essential to take the medication. Let's have a look at some of the side effects that um, can occur with some of the medications that we use for bipolar disorder. If we look at lithium, um, I guess in the first few days, the most common side effects when that's instituted are nausea, which is a sick feeling on the tummy, um, occasionally vomiting, although in my experience that's most uncommon, and diarrhoea. Taking lithium for the first time, oh, I just I couldn't stand it. I, I, I had trouble taking the tablets physically. I was gagging on the tablets at the beginning. Um, for me, they were quite large tablets. Nowadays, I can take you know, a truckload of the things and not have a problem. <laughs> But um, yeah, and um, I didn't like the way they made me feel. I had problems with my hands and I still have problems with my hands to this day. My hands tremor and shake all the time, pretty much. And it's a very disconcerting and embarrassing thing for me. These usually settle down. Um, if they don't, they respond to a reduction in the dose of the medication. They're what we call dose-related side effects. I guess one of the other side effects that long term worries people is that of weight gain and about 30 to 40 percent of people who are taking lithium do gain weight. This is very frustrating. Um, I advise people to be very careful about their diet. Occasionally people get um, craving for sweet foods um, and people find that often because of the thirst, um, which is another side effect on lithium, that they might take many um, soft drinks. There are long term side effects for epilim as well that I'm aware of. So it is, you need, you need to know that, that there could be side effects for things and yeah, but don't stop. I never stopped taking my medication because of the side effects. And I think that stood me in good stead. At the time, some people didn't agree with me, but they were the ones getting ill and I wasn't, so yeah. After taking the, the lithium for a time, 
I just accepted and, um, you know, tried to make the best of it. And after a while, I just didn't even know where I was really taking it. And, you know, it becomes part of life. But it's, it's very important I do take it twice a day. Otherwise, um, I can become unwell. Coming on and off medication is dangerous. Um, I don't recommend doing it unless you consult with your doctor or health worker about why you want to come off the medication or whether you need to change the medication or what have you. Um, some of the drugs that are used to treat people with bipolar disorder um, do have consequences if you come off them abruptly. You know, you do need to come off the drugs um, under some kind of medical supervision and to have some kind of medical information about, you know, how you come off the drugs and what effects are going to happen, you know, if you come off the drugs and what have you. I'm very grateful to medication. <laughs> I wouldn't be sitting here today <laughs> if it wasn't for medication. Uh, but it is hard work learning about what the medication can do, what type of medication I need to take and when I need to take it. It really does mean having a good working partnership, you know, with your doctor um, to find out, you know, what medication's available, when you need to take it, how much you need to take. And to have a sort of close monitoring to make sure that the effects you're getting from the medication are in fact reducing the symptoms of the mood disorder. <laughs> In the last three or four years, I've been hospitalised about six times, mainly because of cannabis. Um, I have a, a period of about two, two to three days only, maximum, before I'm totally off of the fairies. Seeing things sometimes, hearing voices even, um, full schizoid delusions. Um, so going from not eating and sleeping and being a bit irrational and my mum is good at spotting those sort of um, traits um, these days to yeah being totally out of it. I think it's important to recognise that people can prevent relapses of mood disorder. You might not be able to prevent the first episode because you've got no idea it's going to happen. You may not be able to prevent the second episode because hey you're still learning but one of the things that I find really um, interesting and amazing is that as people get older they do learn to prevent the episodes and I think there's a number of things that people can do one is to look at your previous episodes and say what was going on in my life around about those episodes what kind of triggers are likely to sort of set me off is it illness in a close friend or family member is it traveling is it you know shift work is it um, breaking up a relationship um, what is it you know what are the sorts of stresses that trigger me off um, what happens when I, you know, get under stress? Do I stop sleeping? Do I stop eating? Do I, you know, take on more activities? But what actually happens? With me, yeah, usually it's um, if I miss a bit of medication or I'm not sleeping, um, this will lead to, to the symptoms of mania. And the early warning signs are not sleeping, uh, not eating, being ir irritable, um, acting a little bit irrationally. Um, and then with me the problem is I have a very small space of time with which any intervention can be made. Um, I'm talking two or maybe three days where <laughs> they can come in with some antipsychotic medication or something like that and before I'm put into hospital. You may not be able to recognise what's going on. I find that really difficult. I find it very difficult to sit here and say to you, look, I know a lot about what triggers off my episodes. I know what to do, but on the other hand, um, you know, given a sort of period of time after a stressful event, I'm actually not capable of carrying it out. I have to trust somebody else. And that's very difficult. It's very difficult for anybody to do, to say, well, there may come a time in the future where I'm not gonna be able to have control over my life. Okay, so the next best thing is to decide on, you know, one person or a couple of people and tell them what's likely to happen and give them permission to help you out at that particular time. Write it out as a kind of contract, you know, if I'm, if I'm not sleeping I give you permission to contact my GP or my health worker um, and I will agree, you know, to do whatever you tell me to do at that particular time. I trust you to do that. And that I think is pretty important. It certainly saved me from ending up back in hospital quite a few times now. One of the interesting triggers was talking really, really fast. 
So it, it was very subtle, and if you could pick it up quite early, you would know. At the time, it was hard on my brother because I wouldn't believe him, and I'd say, what are you talking about? I'm just confident. And also, I talk fast naturally. So, so, but he'd find the subtlety. And the other trigger was beginning to reduce my hours of sleep. So it would be very slight. It might start off with five hours instead of seven. Well, some of the early warning signs are like increased activity and irritability. And uh, oh, I'd say, uh, you know, you go about things faster, you know, that sort of thing. Well, the trouble is with that, those signs, they're, you know, you're already into the manic attack, you know what I mean? Uh, you're sort of, you're past the point of no return. They're not as easy to recognise, but the sleeping is, you know. That's one, because I, that's why I grabbed it, because it's an early one. It seems to be the not sleeping that, um, you know, builds up the mania. So if you can recognise that, hey, look, you know, when I'm under stress, my sleeping patterns start to get disrupted, then maybe one of the things that's important to do is to start to to, you know, maybe write down a list, you know, for a close friend to say, look, you know, if I go for more than a couple of nights without sleeping or if you've noticed, you know, we've noticed over the last week that my sleeping patterns have got shorter and shorter and shorter, then it's really important that I get some kind of medication to help me to sleep. Maybe I get my lithium levels checked or what have you. But, you know, maybe we've got to sort of do something to make sure I get some sleep. When... Uh... I went up to my son's there and I didn't sleep and I thought, well, I can't, I'm not going to sleep the next night. I, I thought, well, I'm not having this, so I'll take, take this meal at all. And I slept. Yeah. I know for me that if I start to take drugs again, or if I feel the need to do that, then I obviously know that something is going wrong because I self-medicate with drugs. So basically I take a lot of medication, usually, you know, by taking drugs. But, um... It wasn't, it was only not long ago that I actually had a really heavy stint with drugs and I know that there was something going on then and I actually went and saw a psychiatrist after that and she put me on more medication. Um, but it's, if I feel the need to do that or if I find myself, you know, hanging out with people that I used to hang out with and, you know, I, I'm just putting myself back into situations that weren't healthy for me, I know that there's a problem. Also, if I stop going to work or I stop, you know, taking care of myself, then I know that I'm obviously not feeling too good about myself and that there's a problem. And I always, if there's a problem, I get together with my um, mental health worker who we talk it through or I go and see a psychiatrist. I never just let myself go and see what's going to happen. I never do that. People can, you know, prevent relapses. Okay, it might mean, you know, a few weeks of going back onto, you know, a different kind of medication or changing the medication or slowing down your life. But hey, that's going to be a lot better than three months in hospital. It only takes one or two puffs of, of the joint, and um, I get this instantaneous sort of. Um, yeah, sort of really strong euphoria. Um, it's it's like a really strong, fuzzy, warm feeling. You know, it's 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 a really nice feeling. And that's the problem I have. I like smoking the stuff, and a lot of people do. But um, the um, the outcome just isn't worth it. You know, I mean, just about every time I've smoked it in the last three years, I've ended up in hospital. Almost every time. Um, maybe every time. Maybe every time. I view marijuana as poison for somebody who has bipolar disorder. That might seem an extreme statement, but I've seen so many people uh, with bipolar who just so rapidly go into a manic or depressed episode after taking marijuana. There's no doubt in my mind or anybody else's that that is the, the, the main reason, just about the only reason I will become unwell in such a short space of time. With cannabis, it's just a... A big blowout. It just it just happens almost overnight. It's um it's scary. I was constantly depressed and tired. I w couldn't motivate myself to do anything, and it was really scary. It wasn't just physically. It was, you know, mentally. It used to really freak me out. I used to, you know, thought I was hallucinating. I would see things all the time, 
you know, like silhouettes of people running in a, at night time especially, and it was just really nerve-wracking. I couldn't handle it. And that was all brought on by this drug that I actually thought was taking these symptoms away. Some people just take small amounts and that precipitates an episode. So that people have to want, who are in that situation have to understand that if they want to get their lives under control, then they might just have to stop taking that marijuana or control their alcohol use. I used to drink every day, you know, and quite a bit, quite a bit. And uh, I miss it, yeah. <laughs> I'd like to, I'd like to drink again, but I, but I can see, you know, it's, 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 it's one more problem for your brain. So I mean, what, you, know, you don't really need it, do you? I was speaking to my um, case manager just the other day about it, actually, and he was saying that. Um, I mean, I, I said to him, look, I want to, I want to thresh this out. I want to, want to say to you, how many drinks do you think I can have? You know, what's the limit? And he said, OK, let's look at it this way. Maybe four or five beers in a night, spaced out. I think what he meant to say was, just use your common sense. If, if you start to feel yourself getting a bit, you know, um, well, if you feel you're getting to the stage where you're losing a bit of reason, you know, that's the thing. I've always got to have a bit of reason about me if I'm, if I'm to succeed in not having any dope. Yeah, I can understand why people drink with mental illness. It's sort of, you know, when you sober up, of course, it's like anybody else. It's probably doubly worse. You know, you sort of, you've still got your mental illness and, and, and you've got a hangover as well. Being diagnosed with um, bipolar disorder creates some real dilemmas about how you're going to manage the rest of your life. Okay, so maybe you can decide it's never going to happen to you again and you can just go on the way you've been going. But I think most people who have been diagnosed with bipolar disorder and have had, you know, a couple of fairly severe episodes that have been pretty majorly disruptive in their lives do have to make some decisions about the kind of lifestyle they're going to lead. Um, and that might mean deciding that you simply can't cope with shift work or that um, you simply can't cope with a job that means you've got to leave home at 5am in the morning or that you can't go to nightclubs every night and dance the night away or that you can't stay up all night writing essays. It's just um, it's making sure I sleep well. And when I say sleep well, I mean, like, for me, it's about 10 hours a night. Like, it's not you know, seven hours or whatever, I have to get a really good sleep. I have to eat well. I, it's just about eating. It's not so much the food I eat, it's just about eating regularly. Um, I have to eat morning, lunch and night. Finding a job was a big one for me. It was really hard for me to find a job because I had nearly no experience. I had nothing. But when I finally found one, it was one of the best things that ever happened. You know, I finally had money to look after myself maintaining a sort of reasonably stable lifestyle is important for me. The people I live with are important too. I mean, I happen to live with a person who's a pretty regular kind of guy in terms of, you know, meals are on time, meals are regular. He has a sort of fairly, you know, fairly kind of, you know, regular routine. And that really helps me. I think if I'm living with people who themselves are chaotic, it just sort of accentuates the chaos in me. The main thing that I like to do in my life is just um, a balance of everything, um, a bit of exercise, the rhythmic sensation of running along on, on a pavement, it's just very hypnotic for me and it just makes me, I can think about things in, in my head and it's healthy for me. Being healthy for me is important. Um, when I think about the happiest times in my life, it's always been the healthiest times in my life. I play a bit of um, organised sport on the weekends too. I know all the people there, I've been going for a number of years, and it's um, the familiarity of it all. It's very therapeutic for me to, to, to do things like rugby and um, you know, the running and, and, and things like that um, at fixed times during the week because it just makes me feel safe, you know? I mean, I've had so many times in my life where um, I felt alone or scared or, or not safe. Also, I just like spending time just relaxed times with my friends and taking my dog for a walk. Just little things like that I enjoy doing and reading, things like that. If I can do a little bit of 
of each of those things every week, um, I'm, I'm, I'm a happy camper. I swim. Yeah, it's great. No, it helps me lose weight from the the weight gain from <coughs> the pills I've got to take. Um, keeps me fit. Um, yeah, it's good. I've just started a yoga course. You know, we deal with um, yoga stretches to stretch out your body, get, gets rid of all the tension in your body. Um, oh yeah, this is the other thing too. For me at least, um, meditation is, if you can get to some course, there's so many different types of meditation and if you feel uncomfortable about it, it's not always about people sitting in strange positions with their legs around their heads and there's a whole range of types that you can do, you know, ranging from the a bit sort of new agey to the not so new agey. Um, um, you just got to get out there and look under M in the yellow pages and start ringing around and asking people. And They're a fairly biased group in the sense that not everybody... I do find it difficult giving lectures at 8 a.m. in the morning if I'm on medication. That's something I've had to work out with my supervisor at work. So, I mean, I do have to take responsibility to sort of say to my supervisor, look, I'm on medication at the present moment. I do get a medication hangover. I really don't function very well in the mornings when I'm on medication. But I'm happy to work in the afternoons and the evenings. <laughs> um, um, because I need, you know, to get a reasonable night's sleep, I can't work late one night and start early the next morning. Um, OK, sometimes that's unavoidable, in which case then I have to take the following day off to sort of recover. But um, it really does mean sort of working out how my job and the things I'm doing are affecting my mood and my mental state. Um, some people um, actually get a lot of therapeutic benefit out of having a dog or a cat, especially if they're living on, on their own. If you've got a, a dog or a cat that you love, um, you know, I've heard people that said um, that they would stay well um, for the sake of their dog because if they had to go into hospital, their dog couldn't be fed, you know? Simple stuff like that. In addition to the medications, it's important to be aware that many people will benefit from psychological treatment or counselling. The illness has a huge impact upon, um, upon sufferers' self-esteem and, and confidence. I, I could have done with um, some sort of counselling to help me with the, with the devastation of what it was like to go from being king of the castle to, um, to being a zombie in a psych ward, because that, um, that is devastating. Um, yeah, so you, you need the counselling to deal with the devastation of what it's done to your life, and God, even my family could have done with some help. Seeing a counsellor for me was amazing because of her style. She actually got angry with me one time because whenever she would say to me, well, why don't you go out and get your driver's licence? Why don't you apply for uni or do this? Yeah, that's what you want to do. And I'd always say, but I'm a consumer. I, I can't do that because I'll get sick. Or I'll, oh, no, no, that's not, not offered, that's not allowed for me. There was always a block and I was afraid and she got really angry one day and said from now on every time you walk into my office you leave your mental illness at the door I can wait for you when you get home and you come in as Vicky. From my experience um, you need a, um, a balance of medication and counselling like if you just take the medication it's not good enough if you just take the counselling and the brain chemistry goes haywire then you're, then you're stuffed. I think cognitive behavioural therapy is one of the most effective um, counselling approaches for people with mood disorders because in effect it sort of says look you know don't believe everything you think because what you think is um, dominated really by the mood. Um, if I'm depressed I believe that um, I'm hopeless and worthless and I'll never achieve anything. You know cognitive behavioural therapy certainly helps in terms of um, looking at um, the reality of the thinking patterns and certainly helps to work out, you know, what's a depressive thought pattern, what's a manic thought pattern, and what's a okay thought pattern, if you like. Mm. One of the things I found after I was diagnosed was that um, I'd never met anybody else with manic depressive illness. I mean, I probably had, but they hadn't been open about it, so they weren't talking about it. But I hadn't actually ever sat down and talked with somebody else who'd been through similar kind of episodes to me. 
Um, and I really wanted to meet with other people to sort of say, well, did you have the same kind of symptoms? Um, did you take this medication? How long did you take it for? Did it work? Did it not work? Um, um, did you recover <laughs> is what I really wanted to know. And find yourself a support group. Um, people don't go there to, you know, whinge and gas bag. You just say, look, we just exchange um, stories about, you know, oh, have you tried this medication? Oh, that's great, you know. I found a great doctor. Oh, where does he practice? Um, um, the food at this hospital is pretty bad. Don't go there. It was probably one of the sort of peak experiences of my life, actually. I think the things that were important for me was sort of recognising that the symptoms I'd experienced, like being the Virgin Mary, being very grandiose, spending all my money, being suicidal, blah, 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 everybody else had gone through. <laughs> I was initially very scared of going there and I hardly spoke in the beginning because I was so, I had just been diagnosed, I was always getting unwell. But I could not believe in that support group there were people who had, there was a woman who had a PhD and she was a professor and she was going to work every single day and when I talked to her and I heard her story, I, I realised that our stories are similar. She thought she was the Virgin Mary, so did I. And they'd all gone through it, you know, so you've been the Virgin Mary, well, so have I, so what, you know? <laughs> and it sort of normalised it, if you like. Sounds funny to say, but it did normalise it. It was like, well, OK, OK, so it's something that happens, you know. People think they're the Virgin Mary or Jesus Christ when they're manic. OK, it's a common sort of thing. Um, so it helped me to sort of recognise what the symptoms were. And I guess it sort of, it wasn't so horribly me and unique. One of the awful things about um, mental illness is feeling there's something peculiarly horrible about you, you know, that you're the only one in the world who's ever gone through this terribly frightening, terribly sort of ter terrifying sort of experience. It's somehow comforting to know that other people have gone through it too, and they've survived, and they've come out the other end. <laughs> And it's such a relief to know that you're not doing this alone, you know, because um, that makes it really hard, and especially for guys, because um, we don't talk about this, uh, and we die from this. I mean, the doctor can say, if you take this medication, this is what will happen, but maybe you don't believe it. And I remember very clearly one woman who um, had been on lithium for eight years, and this was at a time when, you know, bugger if I was going to take lithium, you know, I mean... Um, I was feeling really nuke about taking it, and uh, but on the other hand, pretty terrified about having another episode. And she'd been taking it, and there was no big deal. Um, and sure, she was getting a few side effects that she thought were fairly minor, but um, but it had given her the security to sort of, you know, raise her kids and, um, you know, sort of the confidence that, you know, within eight years she hadn't had a major episode. So that actually was one of the sort of key things in making me decide that, well, OK, you know, um, if I'm this worried about having another episode, um, there's nothing too dreadful and awful about taking lithium, you know, for a period of time um, until I'm sort of confident um, and can discuss with the doctor about the possibilities of not taking it again. What do you reckon? <laughs> Sounds pretty good to me. <laughs> when I'm sick, I, I tend to go and visit my friends and, and um, sometimes my family <laughs> at um, very early times in the morning or or late at night because I'm full of energy, I'm zipping around everywhere, you know, it's, um, it's a very um, awkward time for me and as a matter of fact it, it's put a bit of a strain on some of my friendships, um, my family. This is in essence a physical condition akin to diabetes, akin to a cancer or heart disease. Um, now there are clearly factors that can make and behaviours that can make the condition better. Um, but in essence, it's physical. I think that's an important point. Um, because even carers and spouses, those closest to the individual, um, can sometimes be stigmatising, um, can sometimes be putting the person down if they're not careful. So I think to respect the fact that this is an illness no different to many others in medicine. I think family and friends are very important in terms of providing supportive environments or providing some kind of structure in the person's life. And it can be very difficult to move from um, looking after someone who's totally dependent, as people often are when they're very depressed, to, you know, treating the person as a responsible adult who can sort of get on with the rest of their life and what have you. Um, I think it's fairly important for family and friends to get information about just what manic depressive illness actually is. Maybe talk with other family and friends, you know, who uh, have been through it. 
um, and maybe negotiate with a person about what the person wants them to do or not to do. I think it's important that if you do notice something to say something. A lot of the time you wonder if it's your place to say something and maybe you should leave it up to them. And I'm, sometimes you get a negative response if you say something like that, but at least you've opened their eyes up to that, you know, option. Like, at least you've said to them that, well, look, you know, there is something that you can do about it. And obviously if it, got, if it went too far, then I would actually make an appointment for them. Um, I think in general, most people with the illness afterwards are pleased if they're brought into treatment early. Now, that's not always true because I've had some um, family members who say they've never been forgiven um, for um, getting their relative in contact with professionals. I think that's in general the minority. You know, take my mum for example. Sometimes she got to the point where she didn't even, she was no longer in touch with reality and she didn't know that there was something wrong, you know what I mean? She thought everything was going well, so how can someone expect her to go and make an appointment when she thinks she's fine? So, I mean, that was, you know, my time to step in then. Maybe the best thing is, you know, if the health worker, the person and, you know, a support person can get together and to say, well, OK, um, what's happening at the present moment? What are the kind of supports that are going to be needed in the future? If there's a relapse, who's going to do what, you know? Um, um, is it possible for the person to be looked after at home? Should the person go to hospital? Um, you know, what are the sorts of likely scenarios? Um, um, and I think, yeah, I don't want to damage my relationships, for example, by being so sort of ill that um, it's going to sort of damage my relationships. You know, it's probably going to be better for me to go to hospital and be looked after professionally than to put too much strain on my existing relationships. There was a time there I was unwell. Well, I was in hospital three times in the space of about six months or something, you know. It was just crazy. And that was mainly cannabis related. Um, and, um, yeah, my, my family, I think, was starting to, to crack a bit, you know. The, 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 um, the, 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 the generous cup was starting to run over, you know. It was just getting to the point where they didn't have any more reserves to call upon, you know, and they were just... Um, um, yeah, starting to to lose it a bit, but um, um, they still managed to, to to visit me in hospital, and uh, that that's important. When you're in hospital, if if no one comes to see you, you get pretty pretty dark on yourself. And uh, yeah, um, I mean, my mum and my dad, especially every day, <laughs> same time, it was really nice. You know, it's just you look forward to those little visits. I think the important thing to remember is that um, you can have a life, you can have a successful life with bipolar disorder. I remember after I was first diagnosed, my partner took me out to dinner, a really nice restaurant. We're sitting there looking out at the view and I'm sitting there saying, boo-hoo, I've got bipolar disorder, it's the end of my life as I know it, <laughs> and what have you. And I sort of stayed quite depressed actually for sort of a few days and then this sort of gradually sort of you know went away and what have you and and after a period of time I learned that in fact I could do the things I'd always done in fact I could do more than I always done because now at least I had some mechanisms for ensuring that you know the episodes of depression didn't go on forever I could in fact prevent you know some of these episodes from occurring and I actually had some control over my life <laughs> you are more than your illness you are not manic depressive, no. You are John Smith, who's 33 years old, who barracks for Essendon, who works at so-and-so, has got two kids, um, a dog, and a few mates, whatever. That's you. Oh, and you happen to have manic depression. You've just got to make sure that you, you know, look after yourself and if you feel like you're going down, you just got to remember which one's better. You know, you're feeling well or you're feeling low, you know, and like you're not worth anything. Which one do you prefer? I always choose feeling good about myself, so I constantly want to take care of myself, you know. Bipolar disorder is a very treatable condition. For the vast majority, um, the commencement and the continuation of adequate and appropriate treatment just makes such an enormous difference. 
Um, and I've seen that with many patients that I've treated, that I view this optimistically, this condition, that although it's difficult and um, disorganising and terrible condition, that when the treatment's right, it just makes such an enormous difference. So I view this very optimistically. I think you've always got to be conscious of this illness. It never really goes away completely. But you can, you can um, control it to the point where it doesn't, it doesn't control you, you control it. Um, and life just is there for, for you to take and um, experience. Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, it's a wonderful life, yeah.